Good morning, church. Would you please stand if you're here in the house, the few of you that are here, and those of you in your homes, uh, would you find the Bible and stand as we uh, read the word of the Lord this first Sunday of October. Psalm 90. It's one of my go-to psalms in times of difficulty. I've read this psalm over people's last days of life, last breath. Read this psalm at funerals. I think it's the heart and the wisdom of God for us in times like we are in today. Psalm 90, verse 1 reads, English Standard Version, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust, and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set your iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we bow before you. We are humbled before you. We worship, revere, stand in awe of who you are. God, thank you for your love for your people. Thank you for your grace toward your people. Teach us, Lord, today. Give us a heart of wisdom today. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Welcome to October and what's often referred to as the harvest season. You know, as the weather and the colors supposedly change, we are reminded that in the various seasons of life, God is with us. I love that first night of October this past week. Uh, you may have seen that. I saw it. It's called the Harvest Moon. Did you all see that? It was the name comes from when farmers depended on the moon's light to harvest their crops late into the night. It was brilliant. It was full. It was whole. It was orangish. Perhaps for us, maybe for me, it reminds me that God is a light late into the night of my life. God has a purpose for the harvest moon, and it all begins with God. This past week, I traveled to Texas to be part of, a, of services honoring my tia Sada, Flores Lopez, who, in a sense, led the Flores family to its current spiritual legacy that we now live. Tia Sada accepted the Lord and prayed for her younger siblings to come to the Lord. And they did. And four of her brothers, rascals as they were in the day, came to the Lord, and they became pastors. One of those brothers of my Theosada was my dad. We are part of that legacy of faith that one woman, one family, one generation influences others to turn to God, and it all begins with God. 
as we participate later today in the sacrament of Holy Communion, we remember that God has a purpose. And God is involved in our past. Jesus died. God is involved in our present for as often as we do this. And God is involved in our future until he comes again. God is for all seasons of life. God loves his people. God cares for his people. In chaotic times, in pandemic times, in suffering, in loss, it all begins with God. The last few weeks, we've been in a series called The Story of the Gospel throughout the Old Testament. We looked at Genesis and God in the beginning. God creates. We saw that God redeems and God restores. In addition, we came to read and learn about the covenant, that the covenant has a maker, the maker sends a messenger, and the messenger carries a message. God loves his people, and God will see his people through. It all begins with God. Through this journey through the Old Testament, we've learned that people want to be human, and people want a human king often to replace the king of kings. And at some point, kingdoms are unified, and that generally leads to kingdoms that are divided. Power seems to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. People seem to divide because we're people, because we are human, because we're self-centered. We forget that it all begins with God. Sometimes as we walk through the Christian life, it's easy to fall into the trap of just going through the motions. In such times, it's so important for us to revisit the words of Scripture regarding what it means to truly know God. We were encouraged through our worship experience today to truly know God. Part of the Bible section is, is referred to as the wisdom literature. It provides some valuable reminders and yet practical instruction. Wisdom books are part of a subcategory called the writings that belong to the Old Testament and includes Job, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, and Proverbs. The wise, the wise men at that time were gifted with godly wisdom, it was thought, and counsel concerning practical and philosophical issues of life, much of which is captured in Proverbs. Some of us think that the Bible is mostly about getting people to heaven, getting right with God, or getting saved. However, the Bible is also concerned about living on earth, living well, as Eugene Peterson says, or living right. Proverbs is like a map. It marks areas of spiritual, emotional, and relational danger for us, challenging us to walk carefully on the path. It guides, but as one writer says, but it also warns. Proverbs concentrates on earth as it is in heaven. Proverbs focuses on the here and now. Proverbs is about doing the right thing, living an ethical life, living life that worships God and serves his people. Proverbs, if you go with me, chapter 1, verse 1, it starts with the title. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Proverbs in the Hebrew comes from the word mishlai, meaning an oracle or a parable or a wise saying. It implies to rule, to set the standard, to govern life. It is not a collection of human wisdom, but the divine expectations and rules from heaven to earth. The word was often thought to mean the example, or as some say, a book of practical ethics. I have the opportunity to teach a college course on ethics. And in our view of ethics, we come to understand that it's hard to teach about ethics when there's no standard, there's no rule, there's no expectation. 
You can read about ethics from the writings of Socrates, from the writings and thoughts of Plato and Aristotle and Cyrus, and from people like Bonhoeffer who wrote a book called Ethics. However, we can also learn about ethics from reading the Proverbs, because it's thought that Proverbs is to impart moral wisdom and uncommon sense for right living. It focuses us on our practical life. You see, while Solomon was king of Israel, the Lord appeared to him in a dream and, full, and offered him the desire of his heart. Can you imagine that, God appearing to you in a dream and offering you the desire of your heart? What is your desire? It is thought that Solomon at that point was overwhelmed with responsibility, overwhelmed with pressure, stress, overwhelmed with working and serving and dealing with people, yet had still a desire to do the right thing. The Lord appeared to him in this dream and offered him the desire, 1 Kings 3, verse 5. And he says, of all things he could ask for, he asked for wisdom. So Solomon writes from his education, and he writes from his experience. But he also writes from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he writes to all of us who believe, who will seek truth, who want to do the right thing. According to 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32, Solomon produced 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs in his lifetime. Verse 2 of Proverbs chapter 1 reads, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight. The book of Proverbs collects this God-given wisdom for us. The goal, some writers suggest, is to instill the right attitude and behavior in God's people. Wisdom, another Hebrew word called hakma. It's the knowledge and ability to make right choices at the opportune time. Oh, how many of us need wisdom to make the right choices at the opportune time? Wisdom, being skillful or knowing what to do with what you know. There are many people who know a lot. However, not many who know what to do or who, who do the right thing. The book is also for, some writers say, discernment or discipline. Verse 3, you go with me to chapter 1, reads, To receive instruction in wise dealing in righteousness, justice, and equity. You would have thought this was written six months ago. Wisdom as good sense or soundness. Read verse 4 with me. It says, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Are we simple today or are we complicated by our own human wisdom? Discretion to the youth. There is a focus on guiding the young to make righteous and moral choices. I think we need a little bit of that wisdom. It seems primarily addressed to the young person who does not know, but it also claims relevance for those who are already wise or who think they're already wise. It is knowledge and prudence to the young, but the wise also hear and gain learning. Wisdom. In a biblical sense, has to do with honoring God and becoming skillful in honoring our relationships. Wisdom has to do with the way we raise our children, handle our money, and control our pleasures. Wisdom has to do how we work, go to school, live a single or married life. Wisdom is how we treat others, what we eat and drink control our emotions, serve in the church, and ultimately serve God. Wisdom is a philosophy of life. Philosophy, philo, to love. Sophia is wisdom, a love of wisdom. Wisdom is not easily understood and hard to comprehend, and it's definitely not common. Wisdom, as my, my colleague writes, requires heart. The best common sense definition one of my colleagues wrote is wisdom is the reasoning of the heart. 
It's not just the brain only or physical strength. It takes heart. The heart thinks, feels, has strength, and challenges us to decide and moves our determination to understand. Wisdom. So how does this all start? Where does it all begin? How can we know how to do the right thing? Proverbs, the example, the standard, the rule, the superiority, gives us the answer. The purpose of this book is given in the first seven verses. It all begins with God. Chapter 1, verse 7 reads, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The Cambridge Bible Dictionary describes this as the model for the whole book, this verse, and for the whole theme of wisdom. It's thought that Albert Einstein wrote, Wisdom is not a product of schooling, but of the lifelong attempt to acquire it. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. This is the core theological claim of Proverbs. It all begins with God. My people, my family, my church, our church, it all begins with God and the desire to follow and imitate God as revealed in Jesus Christ. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. What is that? Well, in our common term, we might say uh, wisdom begins with worship. Perhaps why we start every gathering with worship. Worship, what is that? Is it singing? Is it playing? Worship, we call this the worship service. Worship is, is reverent awe, one writer says. It is the ultimate respect. It is, it is acknowledging God's power and sovereignty. Worship. Fear or worship knows who really is in charge when you worship someone. Worship understands that I am not all-powerful. I am not all-knowing, and I am not everywhere at once. I cannot control my life. Our attempt to reach God brings us closer to God when we worship. And as Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, the end of all the matter has been heard. Fear God or worship God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. The attitude, one writer says, is essential in gaining true worship that makes a difference in our thoughts and behavior. Worship from the beginning. Oh, come on. That's why we start service with worship. At worship with the beginning. When you get up in the morning, your first moment, worship starts, is from the beginning. Worship and the beginning, it only, it's, only, it's not only the beginning, but it's, 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 it's not the end. It is a starting point, and as one other person says, it's the essence. The fear of the Lord is the chief part of both knowledge and wisdom. When we equate the worship of the Lord with the beginning of wisdom, it implies that without knowing God, wisdom is impossible. In addition, knowing God is an element of wisdom. It all begins with knowing God. It all starts with the reverence of God. It all makes sense when we first worship God. The foolish person thinks they are wiser than God is. The foolish person believes they know more about life than God does. However, the proverb says, the highest wisdom comes only to those who search deeply for it through a proper relationship with God. It all begins with God. It also teaches us that wisdom pays close attention. Go with me to chapter 1, verse 8, when it says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction. Hear with an expectation to learn. Hear through relationship. We are called to learn as a student from a teacher or as a child from a parent. Hear to learn. Now, some of you may have been told, like me, when someone was giving me instruction, 
And they thought that I was just listening and not hearing. Because I'd say, oh, I hear you. Oh, no, you're just listening. You're not hearing. Hearing is not just listening. Hearing is to gain understanding. Hearing to gain knowledge. Hearing to receive education. We can gain understanding through education. Or we can learn through experience. One of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes states that experience the most brutal of teachers, but you learn. My God, do you learn. Here to learn and here out of relationship. Verse 8 once again says, Hear my son, your father's instruction. The writer explains the role of relationship in gaining wisdom. Son is a tender call from a loving God. We gain wisdom out of relationships. We gain truth when we are in a relationship. When we're not in a relationship, sometimes we don't tell the truth because we feel people can't handle the truth. But he says, here, my son, this relationship. The writer explains this whole role of God in this relationship. Your God cares. Our Father cares. John Maxwell uh, stated, and I use this quote in my education classes all the time, that students don't care what you know until they know that you care. Well, I want to tell you, friends, God cares, God loves, and God desires to give you wisdom for life. It all begins with God. We see here that wisdom has rewards. Chapter 1, verse 9 says, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. You think about that. In, in biblical thought, wisdom can be a skill, a body of knowledge, or an attribute of God, one commentary says. Wisdom is often described in the feminine, she, personal terms, similarly to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Wisdom takes on the role of God leading, com com comforting, revealing drawing to God. The fruit of wisdom is like the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We wear wisdom so we don't forget who we are. You are a child of God. A child of God. It says, for they are graceful garland for your head. The garland around the head back in that culture represented the highest glory, the highest attainment, the highest joy. The wreath on the head was meant that you were a winner. God calls you a winner. You are a child of God. Furthermore, it says the gold chain around the neck was worn by the kings. And as one writer says, the favorites of kings. You wear wisdom around your neck. You are God's favorite. Do not ever forget that we are children of God. Wisdom has its rewards. Wisdom also leads to a secure life. Verse 33, I'm just going to jump to the end of the chapter 1 of Proverbs. says, but whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of a disaster. What a prophetic word for us today. What a prophetic word for today in the middle of, of a pandemic in the middle of our own president being infected, we've come to understand we don't know how this happens. We don't know how, how this takes place. In the midst of all this, whoever listens to me, God says, will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Many, many of us suffer from insecurity. We are insecure of the present. We are insecure of the future. However, in God, we live with security. We live with peace, even in political chaos, even in a global pandemic, even in social injustice. One version reads, shall be quiet from the fear of evil. In security, in confidence, in peace, Benson writes, we may enjoy peace of conscience and confidence in God, be free from evil in life, in death, and forever, as Matthew Henry writes. Wisdom has rewards. So let me just remind us that wisdom begins with God. We want to know how to deal with life. 
how to serve and work with people, wisdom begins with God. We know in our day and age, we go, we go to many places for advice and for wisdom in our society. We go searching for answers and searching for wisdom all the time. We can turn to God or we can turn to, to Google, right? We, where does your search begin? Do you go to Google first or do you go to God? We can begin with God or we can begin with social media and its various platforms. We can begin with God or we can begin with YouTube or Yelp to get advice. Much of modern wisdom is really based on self-serving agendas. Think about that. When you go to a, a site, there's usually going to be a commercial there. It's self-serving. Most of our own human wisdom is self-serving. It's, it's, it's centered on ourself. We bring our own lenses of self when we try to make decisions. But the wisdom that originates from God is found from the beginning of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Old Testament wisdom teaches us that a reverence for God, a fear of God, a worship of God is the beginning of understanding what true wisdom really is all about. So as you start a new search, as I continue in a search for truth, perhaps we can begin with God. We can apply the truth that God is the beginning of all wisdom. We can live according to the cultural norms, or we can live according to the standard, the example, the proverbs, the doctrine, the dogma. Today is a new day for all of us, and it all begins with God.